Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How to Start a Babysitting Co-op, hosted by the Center for a New American Dream. My name is Wen Lee, and I'm the Director of Online Media and Engagement. Before we begin, I just want to confirm that everyone can hear me. So if you can hear me, can you please chat on the uh, bottom left-hand corner of your screen and just let me know that you can hear me. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Vicki, and thank you, Noriko, <laughs> and everyone else. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Well, I'm so thrilled that you are here today for our webinar. Um, we will be talking today about how to start a babysitting co-op, and we have two great speakers joining us today, and I hope that everyone will learn a lot about babysitting co-ops, how they work, and how to start one in your own neighborhood. So let's get started here. I first want to give an introduction about the Center for a New American Dream and I'll tell you about the organization. So the Center for a New American Dream is a nonprofit organization based in Charlottesville, Virginia, but serves the country nationally. The Center for a New American Dream as you see on the screen is our mission statement, helps Americans to reduce and shift their consumption to improve quality of life, protect the environment, and promote social justice. We really want to promote a new American dream that's not focused on materialism and commercialism, uh, as our media widely uh, promotes to us, but instead to change the American dream to be towards what really matters, which is community building, relationships, um, happiness, and a meaningful work. So uh, our three program areas are redefining the dream beyond consumerism and collaborative communities. And um, this webinar series is part of the Collaborative Communities Program. Uh, through this webinar series, we hope to give people hands-on practical tools on how to do cool projects in their community that uh, build community and also make life easier, simpler, and more sustainable. So um, if you're interested in knowing about our future webinars, uh, please join our mailing list and you'll be notified as to when we have future webinars. So today we'll be talking about babysitting cooperatives or babysitting co-ops. What is a babysitting co-op? Well, as you'll learn today, there are many, many different kinds of babysitting co-ops, um, different sizes, different models, um, and different kinds. So um, there isn't one simple answer to this. But in general, what all babysitting co-ops have in common is that a group of parents um, have an agreement with each other that they will share babysitting among themselves um, without the exchange of money. And you'll be learning much more today about what this looks like in practice. Today we have two speakers, Renee Gallagher, who lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Julie Holland, who lives in Berkeley, California. Um, both of them have started successful co-ops in their neighborhoods. And you can see here that they are proud parents of beautiful children. And I will warn everyone that this webinar is full of ridiculously cute photos of children. Um, so just be forewarned about that right now. <laughs> so um, Renee and Julie will uh, be available to uh, answer your questions that you have um, about um, um, their experience starting up co-op. Um, and um, they'll talk a little bit about their experiences as well. So. Um, we're going to start um, with presentations by Renee and Julie, uh, about 10 minutes each. They'll talk about their personal experiences and share some advice with you about um, how you can start a babysitting co-op in your neighborhood. Then uh, we'll talk about some resources that are available online uh, that can help you as well for starting a babysitter co-op. And then we really want to have a nice Q&A session for our speakers. Um, so we will have a chance to um, allow you to ask your questions to the speakers. So um, throughout the webinar, if you have questions, please submit your questions to me by chatting them privately 
to the leaders and assistance um, um, item in the uh, chat box. So on the bottom left in the chat box, there's a public tab, but there's also a private tab. And if you click on the private tab, you'll see um, there's the top lines is leaders and assistance. And if you chat your question to me, I will keep a list of it. And at the end, during Q&A, I will uh, go down the list and answer as many questions as we can. Um, for those of you who are wondering, um, this webinar is being recorded. And we'll be sure to make the slides and the recording available online um, starting uh, at the latest next week. And you will receive an email <coughs> when um, the when the slides are, are up and the recording is available. OK, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Renee Gallagher. Um, again, she lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, Renee, if you are ready, I will give you the floor. And you're welcome to take it away. OK, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, great. Let's see, let me just make sure I can advance here. OK, so I'm Renee Gallagher. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, as Wynn said. And uh, my son and I started our, our time together. I was a single mom, a single mother by choice, you might say. I opted to become a single mom. And at, I decided that I was going to stay home for the first year of my son's life. And so um, after about six months or so, I thought, I need to figure out how I'm going to do child care here um, and be able to work a little bit and still be home with my child much of the time. I'm a physical therapist and a massage therapist. And um, at this point, I have my own practice and have since my son was born. But I just needed small amounts of child care at the beginning. So um, I decided I would start a babysitting co-op. So who needs a babysitting co-op? In my case, I was a single parent. Um, in our babysitting co-op currently, we have five single parent families and 10 partnered uh, parent families. We have some people that are stay-at-home parents, as I was for the first couple of years of my son's life. And we also have people that work full time. So really, who needs a co-op? Anybody that has a child or children uh, would benefit from having a babysitting co-op. So why have a babysitting co-op? Why do we need this? Uh, for me, the primary reason was to get a support network and a community connection in my neighborhood. Um, I live in an area where there are lots of families with young children. And I thought, um, I need to know who these people are. And if they're people that are like-minded, I'd like to share childcare with them. So one of the things that's come up over the years for me as a parent is I've always wanted to feel like childcare was reciprocal. I wanted it to be a fair trade. And the beauty of a babysitting co-op, which you'll learn about in a minute, is that it's always a fair trade. It doesn't matter who you trade with. Um, it's all being recorded. It's being um, taken care of so that you don't feel like you owe somebody, um, which is something that kind of weighed on me. If somebody had my son overnight, I felt like I needed to have their children overnight. And this kind of takes that out of the equation. And you can trade with whoever you want, whenever you want. And then the idea of having play dates with parental oversight, um, paying a babysitter who's a teenager who lives down the street, that's great. you know. But it's expensive. It costs about $10 an hour for a babysitter. And it's one person with your child. And um, really, what many, many kids want is to play with other children, um, so particularly people that have only one child, like, like me. And the other thing is free childcare. Uh, this is a way of having your childcare needs met without putting out a lot of money. And for me, the babysitting co-op, I would say I have paid a babysitter probably less than 10 times in my entire seven years of parenting. Now that except for uh, preschool and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's worked out beautifully um, over the years in terms of getting out, going out in the evenings, that sort of thing. So how did I get started? The primary resource that I used was a book called The Smart Mom's Babysitting Co-op Handbook. 
and I found it online. I think I just Googled babysitting co-ops, and there was this book. And it was um, it, it was a great how-to guide, a, a startup guide. It had in the back of it. Um, I glanced at it the other day. It's got most of the forms that we still use in our babysitting co-op currently. So I think they were available online back when I did this um, six years ago, but um, I didn't find them when I looked the other day. So that book was instrumental in getting me going. So first I identified interested people, uh, families in my neighborhood. I was part of a mom's group that had about, I think there were probably 50 members. It was a nationwide group called the Moms Club. And I see that Noriko is on um, our list today of participants, and she was part of that group. And so I sent out an email to the Moms Club uh, group, and I said, anybody want to um, work on a startup babysitting co-op with me? And Noriko, among others, um, said, yeah. And so we got a group of families together, and um, I did a little bit of preliminary work by looking up bylaws for other co-ops in all around the country. I just typed in babysitting co-op bylaws, and I looked them up, and I created some bylaws for our group that are available as part of this webinar. I believe they're a PDF file that you can download. But feel free to steal from mine, uh, use ones you find on the internet, take what you like, leave out what you don't. And um, we've pretty much looked at all the different scenarios, or many different scenarios, that could come up during the course of, of getting a babysitting co-op going. So then once I did that, I set up a meeting. And we all sat around um, a circle at a park. The kids ran around, and, and probably maybe eight or 10 of us talked about what a babysitting co-op was and what we wanted to create. And um, from there, we, we started it up. So joining our babysitting co-op, aside from that first group of people that were essentially hand-picked, um, in order to get in, you have to be sponsored by another active member in the co-op. And the way our bylaws read is that they have to have been a, um, an active participant for six months in order to sponsor another family in. And in order to sponsor someone, that means that you would babysit for them, and you would feel comfortable having them babysit for you. And the presumption is that you know them well and that you're willing to vouch for their character, essentially. Because the biggest thing with this is you want to know that the people babysitting your children are people that you would want babysitting your children, that they're trustworthy, safe, and might share your values. So um, when people want to join up, I will ask, it, usually a member will say, I have a friend and they want to join. And I'll say, well, have your friend call me and I'll talk to them. And I usually talk to them and ask them what they're looking for and, and assess their interest, and then we get them started if there's room. Um, I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. So some of the things to consider when you're starting a co-op. Geography. Um, all of the families in our co-op live within five miles of a certain corner, uh, which was about a mile from where I live. And um, in order to join, you really needed to be within those geographical boundaries. Because if you're going to drop off your child to be babysat, you don't want to drive 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go drop them off, and then drive 20 or 30 minutes to come back and do whatever you wanted to do, because then you've just lost a good chunk of time that's um, towards you know, the, the free time that you had. Another issue is home safety. Um, we have some folks who have family members that hunt and uh, guns or something I hadn't really ever thought about. So that was something that came up in our co-op, that if you have guns, uh, they need to be locked up. And we need to know that, that, that you have them, because if there are people that are uncomfortable with that, then uh, they need to be able to make a, a choice about that. Um, dues. We charge $20 per year. We've charged $12 per year up until this year. And if anybody's interested in hearing what our dues go for, um, just you know, ask us that question later. Um, and then creating opportunities to meet other participants. Again, what people want is to feel comfortable with who is watching over their children. And so they need to get to know each other. So in our case, we get together for a monthly play date at the park, or 
every other month we typically have a potluck. So we'll get together at somebody's home or at the park or at a venue and we'll have some sort of a, um, a play date or a party. And that's really been wonderful in terms of the community building and helping people feel more comfortable with getting to know the other families, getting to see how the kids interact with each other. So how does this work? We've got 15 families. We cap it at 15 in our co-op, and we currently are maxed out at 15. Uh, we look for people that have children of similar ages, and I've started to now require that they have at least one girl, which is probably <laughs> not appropriate. But we have currently 16 boys in our co-op and eight girls. And they're between the ages of one, I think our youngest is one year old, and our oldest is probably eight. Um, we also have a coordinator, and that's me, although I'm happy to give up the reins if somebody else wants to be the coordinator. Uh, that would be great. That was originally stipulated that we would have, I think it was a one-year tenure for the coordinator, and now I'm up to six years. So I'm happy to pass the baton at some point, but that just hasn't happened yet. And then every month we have a different secretary. So we have a hard a hardcover three ring binder that goes from secretary to secretary. And that secretary is the person that logs the points into the book. Um, so as you see below there, the point system is that it works that if, if someone someone requests a sit or someone offers to sit for someone, they the sitter earns four points for every hour for one child and six points for every hour that they sit for two children and on and on. And there's uh, several other different ways to earn points. If you go and pick up a child at a preschool uh, for another parent, you earn an extra two points on your, on your sit. There's some other stipulations for nighttime. After a certain hour at night, you know, the points go down to one per hour. Um, so after you've done your sit, you report your points to the secretary. The secretary logs the points into the book. And then at the end of each month, I get the book back from the secretary. And I basically check to make sure that all the points have been logged. They've been taken away from the person who had the sit done for them. And they've been added on to the person that did the sit. And it's basically like balancing the checkbook at the end of the month. So we've had a few um, challenges over time, but mostly successes. That picture there is of one of our parties we had, which um, was a, our five-year anniversary party. We got all the kids uh, babysat at a park about half a mile from where we were. We hired babysitters using our dues money. And we provided food for all the kids at the park. We provided a bathroom right across the street at one of our members' homes. And we had a one to five ratio on the kids. Um, and the adults all got together for a catered dinner at a local venue. And it was a whole lot of fun. So part of our successes have been that we have, um, we communicate. Uh, we, if somebody isn't very active in the co-op and we're looking, um, there's other people that want to join, I might ask that person, you know, would you consider is this something you'd like to start utilizing more, or is it time to move on? And we've had several families that have that have come and gone, and um, but never on a bad never on a bad note. It's always been for various reasons of you know the kids uh, got you know old enough that uh, they were just busy with other activities, or it wasn't really fitting into the lifestyle of the parents. And we maintain an active or an updated contact list. Uh, we also have a listserv where we communicate information to one another, and um, that helps us. If somebody's looking for a sit, they can just send a message, one message to the entire group. A couple challenges, you know, people picking people up late, canceling at the last minute certainly can be pose a problem. And then, as I mentioned, uh, moving on is not usually a problem. Um, occasionally, there might be a family that isn't fitting in very well. Uh, for one reason or another, and we've had that happen one time. So I had to deal with that, and that was challenging. But for the most part, um, we started pretty small. It was me talking to people about what I wanted, what I envisioned, and then it's grown into this fabulous network of um, supportive people and, and lifelong friends, hopefully for me and for my son. 
and um, with very little effort. Truly, this has been uh, something that has not taken up a lot of my time and has provided me with, with such great rewards. So on that note, I will hand it back to Wen, and then you'll hear from Julie. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Renee. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and again, I wanted to remind everyone that we are collecting questions for both Renee and Julie at the end of, uh, uh, at the end of Ju Julie's presentation. So um, if you have questions, feel free to submit the questions to me through the private, the private tab of the chat. You can chat it to leaders and assistants. Um, I will keep a list of questions, and we'll go through as many as we can um, by the end of this webinar. So feel free to send more questions. OK, so following Renee, we have Julie Holland, who is a mother, lives in Berkeley, California. And um, she also has experience starting a babysitting co-op here in the Bay Area. So without further ado, I will pass the mic to Julie. Hello there, it's Julie, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about my co-op. Um, Julie Holland, I have a four-year-old daughter, and I have a husband also named John. Um, we live in Berkeley, California, in more of an urban type area. I'm managing our home full-time, and I'm with our daughter full-time. I work as a part-time copy editor and orientation and mobility specialist, working with visually impaired and blind people. And I became interested in a co-op because I wanted to go back to grad school to become an orientation and mobility specialist, as I was just saying. And um, I wanted my daughter to be taken care of by my friends while I was in school. I didn't want somebody looking at her and just seeing her as a, you know, a paycheck or <laughs> whatever. Um, so, and I also wanted to take care of my friends' kids in the same way. So I decided to start a very small co-op. And I am very, very small potatoes compared to Renee. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm more of a relaxed, small kind of co-op person here. And um, so I guess I'll get started with my slides here. So I'm probably going to end up repeating a lot of what Renee said, so I'll probably end up going quicker than she did. Um, the idea of my co-op was to do a small one, and she has a bigger one. I actually am part of two co-ops. I'll explain the differences between them later. But um, there are all different types of co-ops. And the best way to figure it out, I think, isn't to look at a menu of different co-ops and choose the one you want, but to think about your own family and what your own needs are and then go from there. So imagine the plan that you want for your co-op and don't spend too much time researching. I started to do research online and I kind of got overwhelmed and said, you know what, this isn't for me. I need to just focus on what I need and go from there. And I would also say start simple much easier to start simple than to do something big and complex. So once you are deciding to get started, the first step, I believe, is to think it through. And I also did a fair amount of praying before I started mine. Um, my husband and I prayed together about who should be part of the co-op, and it ended up working out great. So um, I asked one or two starter people. I actually go to the Berkeley YMCA and um, looked around for people to include, asked friends that I knew um, from different places. So get your starter people in line, and then uh, step three there on the slide. Then on your own or with the other people, you can start developing the plan. I ended up developing my plan myself and then asking the other people, are you OK with this? And everyone said yes. And so that was easy. And then we just started babysitting. <laughs> so uh, again, decide who you want to be in it. Either you can base your co-op on a set group, like a, a mom's group or a church group or something, or with friends of, who have similar aged kids. Um, it is easier if everyone knows each other already. I actually started out with only people that knew me, and they didn't know each other. And I tried to get them to know each other, and they all liked each other, but they weren't really, for some reason, super comfortable with swapping with people they didn't know super well. So I actually ended up being kind of the hub of my co-op. And so I actually needed more care than other people did. So I had about two or three friends weekly that I was swapping with. I don't do it that much anymore because um, I'm not in school anymore. But I still do swap with different people on a regular basis. One or two of them we swap every week. So um, 
yeah, but for a while it was me swapping with three or four people <laughs> every week. So I had a lot of babysitting to do when I wasn't in school, which was great. We had a great time. So anyway, um, make it very clear what you're asking people for. You're not asking for a one-time deal. You're asking for a longer-term commitment. And like I said, it can be small and simple. Um, you know, but just make it clear you're not asking for a one-time deal or you know, a random kind of situation. And when? You could do it once a month. You could do it two mornings a week, Saturday nights, whatever. Um, make it flexible depending on work or school. Like I was flexible based on school. And um, that was my co-op that I'm talking about. As I said, I'm actually part of another co-op as well. And that co-op only meets once a month on Friday nights. It's more of a date night kind of co-op. And it actually meets at my church. All the uh, couples bring their kids to one location which kind of hits on the next point, which is where. Um, so we have a central location at our church. It's like a child care room, nursery kind of place. And all the kids there hang out together, and we have a playground there. And um, two couples will stay and watch all the kids. We're talking like 15 or so kids. And then um, everyone else goes out and has a date night. So that's kind of a different model. Um, for my own personal co-op, it's you know my house or the houses of my friends and it's more casual and not as set up or formal. So I think we can already say that we agree on the why. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty obvious how awesome co-op can be. And um, the thing that I dis discovered about having my own co-op is that I had to be ready, ready to sell it. I had to figure out why things were most important to me. Um, I mean, sorry, I had to figure out what was most important to me um, as far as community, saving money, the convenience of just being able to call someone. Um, so you might want to have like a 10 second little blurb on how you could sell it. You know, It's a swap of babysitting for babysitting. No money, no strangers, something like that. And then people go, oh, I get it. So that's kind of an easy way to talk about it to parents, friends, etc. So I think Renee um, has, I guess, more of a detailed approach, which I greatly admire and respect. By the way, <laughs> mine was very casual. I actually built a small website to keep track of the work, the points, and hours. And it was just easier for me to do it all myself rather than having to try to figure out if other people input the information or not. Or So um, we decided ultimately for one person, that would be me, to keep track of the points. Um, and I actually do, I do three points for a half an hour and then five points for two kids for a half an hour. Um, kind of a, it, it's fine, you know, but it might be a little bit more complex than I probably would do if I was just starting out. Um, you probably want to think through um, how you're going to incorporate new members. I like Renee's idea actually of having only friends of the people who are, um, who are already in it join. That's pretty neat. Um, I just kind of ask people as I see fit. <laughs> and um, it's worked out great. Um, I've had one great co-op member move away. I miss her very much. She's now far, far away. <laughs> and um, so when she left, she just made sure she had at least the minimum amount of points that she started with. And she had way more than that, actually. She was very generous about it. and. Um, uh, that's how it worked out when she left. Um, we've had other situations come up that were a little bit tougher to handle, but we worked them through. We also worked out a late policy, which was um, if uh, the person is late picking up the child, we just you know keep adding points. And it's never really been that much of a problem. I, I think if it was a problem, then we would address it more directly, but it hasn't been a problem. For rides given, like if I pick up a kid or if someone drops off my daughter for me, then we usually give three points for that. And um, when kids are asleep or when it's like an overnight, which has happened a couple times with us, I usually just drop it down to one child per, uh, you know, for the points. So we're not. I, I've had two or three kids over here overnight, and <laughs> it's you know I don't want to be taking all those points from people because I'm not doing any extra work really. So I just made it a one-time, you know, one-kid point situation. hope that made sense. So successes and challenges. For me, success just meant, means and has meant that all the needs of the people involved are being met. 
there's not a perfect situation. There's no picture perfect way that it's supposed to look. So whatever works for you is the right thing to do. And if you decide to make changes, you need to make them based on what's most important, not on what other people are doing or you think should be happening. Um, I started out my co-op with seven participants. And once we got going, only five people were actually involved. And then one of those only did it one time. And so there were four of us who just jammed. <laughs> we, we were swapping all the time. And it was great. You know, We didn't have to have a certain number of people. or um, Like I said, they were all swapping with me, which was great, because I needed to care um, more than they did. So it, was, it worked out really, really well. And um, as I think I previously mentioned, the expected will, un unexpected will happen. So sometimes kids don't get along, and you just kind of deal with it as it comes up. Families have moved away, and like that. So words of advice, my sage advice here. <laughs> so uh, I think you get the point about it being your co-op. You can make it as big or as small or as simple or as complex as you like. Um, I started my co-op with my friends, and I wanted to make sure that we knew that we were friends first and co-op members second. So I wanted us to be able to talk through things as they came up and not let it build. And so that's worked really well. And once again, only do what works for you. You don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. Um, I use both Google Docs and Doodle Poll. Those have both been helpful. I'm sure there's many other online tools. One of uh, which you'll see at the end here it was a, an app. I was so excited when I saw that one. There was an app. <laughs> I went, oh, man, I've been keeping track of this for no reason. I'm going to try that out. So, um, and also, as I'm sure you can understand, it's very important to keep medical and allergy and so updated. And um, one girl in our co-op actually had an allergy that changed. And so it was nice that we heard about that in a timely fashion. <laughs> so also, of course, be open to change and new ideas. It's not really rocket science. It's really not. If I can do it, you can totally do it. And I will put in a big California, totally do it. <laughs> so just totally, again, communicate, communicate, communicate about what you're doing. Tell everyone what you're doing. And have an awesome time doing it. I know you'll enjoy it. You can do it. Great. Thank you so much, Julie, for that great presentation and for putting up with our temporary technological problems. Um, so Julie and, um, and Renee will both be answering questions that you have. But first, I want to be sure to um, go over some resources that are available online. Um, and first, I want to mention is um, if you like the idea of a babysitting co-op, then you would probably like sharing more things in your life, not just child care, but also other things. So New Dream has a guide to sharing, which is a free PDF online that talks about all kinds of ways to share more in your life. Um, it has ideas on how to, for example, start a tool library, how to do a clothing swap, how to do a time bank, and how to set up cooperatives. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know about this resource um, that you might find um, useful. You can go to guidetosharing.org to download a free copy of this. OK. Now, for babysitting co-ops, um, New Dream has some recommended resources for you as well. We will be putting all these resources on our website. So you don't need to write all of these down right now. But um, these are just some that we know about and that Renee and Julie have recommended to us. So um, the first is the book, Smart Moms Babysitting Co-op Handbook, which Renee mentioned earlier. Um, and she had used this as a great starting point for her babysitting co-op. And as far as I know, this is the, the, the only book or the best known book for babysitting co-ops. It was written a few years ago, um, so it's a little outdated in some ways, but um, it's a very comprehensive guide to um, starting a, a co-op of your own. So um, this is a book that you can check out at the library, or um, I think it's online also, so you can read that online. Um, in addition, um, a lot of really great blogs are out there um, giving advice on babysitting co-ops. I've listed some here. There's Carrie's portfolio. Um, Mommy Lessons 101, 
And Julie Holland herself uh, actually has a really nice guest blog on the Frugal Mama blog, um, which you can check out as well. As for tools to help you keep track of points or you know, um, hours um, in your babysitting co-op, um, you don't have to use paper and pencil. Um, you can use Google Docs, as Julie mentioned. There are actually some tools out there um, online that are designed to help you track hours and points explicitly for babysitting co-ops. Um, three of them, um, the first three here are websites um, that you can do this on. One is Sitting Around, one is called Babysitter Exchange, and one is called Babysitting Co-op. Um, and these are all websites where you create an account and you log in um, and have everyone in the co-op join as members and then you can track points on this website. I believe that um, maybe a few of them require a small fee. Um, so I don't know if these are totally free, but they are available for a, a small fee, I think. Um, and the, the fourth one there is, um, Julie mentioned earlier, is a phone app. It's called You Sit, I Sit. Um, and it's a nifty phone app um, for iPhones where you can keep track of babysitting co-op points on your phone, um, which might be convenient for you. And again, we're going to email out these resources and put them on our website. So um, you don't have to write them all down right now. I'm going to change the slide. All right. Um, another resource we want to make available to you um, that Renee mentioned earlier is her babysitting co-op bylaws. Um, Renee is gracious, graciously um, offered us to um, give a um, offer a copy of her bylaws to everyone on this webinar, so that you can take a look and use it as a template if you are so inclined to use something similar for your babysitting co-op. So thank you so much, Renee, for offering this resource. We will put the link up on our website where you can download it, and we will also email everyone with the link for how to download it. Great. So um, at this time, I want to give some time for questions and answers. Um, and uh, I received some questions throughout the webinar. And also, if you have more questions now, please feel free to chat them in. Um, so uh, the first question um, is um, um, from Ben and also some other um, um, webinar participants. Um, they're wondering that if there is an advantage or a limitation to start with a trusted group, such as a church or an existing um, existing group. So um, for both Renee and Julie, I'm wondering if you have um, any thoughts as to whether um, it's an advantage or a limitation to start with a you know a group like a church um, or maybe a, a neighborhood group. So maybe I'll have Julie answer first. Sure. Um, I think there's both advantages and disadvantages. The, the advantage might be that you know you already know these people, you already pretty much trust them. Um, but I would say a disadvantage might be if something goes wrong, <laughs> you're still going to see them on a regular basis, and you probably are going to have to work it out. Um, so you know, I would say there's probably more advantages than disadvantages because um, you don't have to go hunting people down. I will say one of the persons um, who I started my own co-op with, I didn't even really know her before we started swapping. I, I just saw her um, and we kind of became friends and then I suggested, uh, it was almost like a roommate situation. Like It's kind of hard to be roommates with your friends sometimes because you already know each other. You know, But if it's somebody who's new, it's sometimes easier to, to make those connections and ground rules straight away. Um, so yeah, I would say there's advantages and disadvantages, but if I had a choice, I would do it with people that I already knew, because then you've already got that base of friendship going. Wait, Renee, do you have anything to add? I agree with that completely. I think if I could have um, gotten an entire group from the Moms Club, I probably would have done that. And I just wanted to expand and have a few more families involved, so we went outside of that group. But it's really nice. I think people feel much more comfortable when they know that these people have not just been randomly chosen off of Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. 
Um, so Renee, we have a specific question for you from Trish. Um, she's wondering, in your model, does the secretary check in with both parties to verify that the sitting claimed was actually done? Uh, no, actually. Uh, the way it goes is that the sitter reports to sit, usually sends an email to, uh, there wouldn't be any knowledge that the sit was going to happen prior to the sitter reporting it. So uh, the secretary wouldn't have any knowledge beforehand that that was going to happen. So once the sit happened, it's up to the sitter to report it. It's really up to both participants to make sure that the hours and points are agreed upon. I find that nobody really does that, um, but we do need to make sure that the sitter reports the sit and that it has been acknowledged by the secretary. So that's more the issue is that you know, we don't want one of those emails going off into Never Never Land and the SIT never was acknowledged. So I always tell all our secretaries, be sure to, you know, send a quick email back and say, got it. But that's about as far as we go in terms of double checking. Okay, excellent. Okay, and a, a question for Julie from Trish also. Um, your, your date night church co-op that you mentioned, um, how do you determine um, which couples are watching the kids, do you guys just have a rotation, or how is that chosen? It's pretty much a rotation. So there's one woman in charge of the group, and she sends an email out to everybody um, saying, you know, it's, it's time to set up another round of the co-op. So um, she'll send out a doodle poll listing all the nights that are possible. Like, she'll basically send out a doodle poll to our whole list that says, you know, who can do which nights. And then we choose four Friday nights. Um, that everyone can do, and then of uh, those four Friday nights, she will um, assign couples, you know, who's going to watch the kids on those specific nights. And if someone can't do it that night, then they'll swap with someone else, usually through her, I think. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, I have a question for, for both uh, Julie and Renee, um, and that is with regard to different parenting styles. Um, have you had any um, conflicts with with parents who have very different teach, uh, parenting styles, different rules for what kids are allowed to do, um, and how do you resolve um, that kind of issue? Um, Renee, you want to go first on this one? Sure. Um, one of the biggest issues I think that's come up for us is media. Media is probably a hot button for a lot of families, but um, in our sort of smaller social circle, uh, one of the things that we've set up in our household is that we don't watch TV with our friends. So um, when somebody comes over for a sit, you know, and we have a couple kids over, we're not turning on the television as a way of um, entertaining the kids. It's an opportunity for the kids to play with each other. And there has been an occasional time when I'll pick up my son and he's watching TV at somebody's house, and that's not an issue for me. You know, and, and we do watch TV in our house. Um, and actually, until this year, we didn't have a television. So he's lived without television for seven years. And, and I've lightened up a little bit about this. But I do feel like when you have other children over, it's your responsibility to get a little more creative than that. And um, so that has not really been an issue in our co-op because it appears that most of the people in our co-op share that sentiment. Um, but I think that's part of what we want to continue to support in our group is that we're not, we're, we're really not looking for families that do a lot of television watching, you know, as a form of, of entertainment for kids um, with other kids over. So I don't know if that's uh, clear. We did have a family just join that asked me very specifically, how do we know that they're not watching a whole bunch of television when our kids are over there? And I think that's a really reasonable question. So I think that my preliminary interview kind of goes into that a little bit. And like I said, I've lightened up a lot about television. But um, it, is, it is something that we need to keep in contact about. Does that I guess you can't really answer back, but yeah, um, yeah, thanks. That's that's great, Renee. Um, Julie, you have anything to add? Um, yeah, we we don't watch a lot of TV, but um, I think that's kind of the culture around here. So that's kind of expected. I think that we wouldn't really watch TV at each other's houses. Sometimes, if 
the kids are, you know, really exhausted if they just went to the zoo for the day or something and I'm watching them for another half an hour. They really, really want to see a show. I'll turn one on. It's not a huge deal for us. Um, and I think my friends are the same way. If the kids are just really exhausted um, and they need a break, then I think everyone needs a break at that point. Then, and you know, like I said, we're friends first, so it's not an issue really. I think for us, um, there's a few more issues around safety. Um, I live on a busy street, and there's no fence around the front yard or anything. And there's homeless people, and there's people walking by a lot. And I've asked my friends, are you comfortable with uh, the kids playing in the front yard? And some of them say yes, and some of them say no. And um, so, you know, we kind of do it as we need to do it. And um, we're, basically, we err on the side of caution if there's a question. So I totally respect my friends who don't want that to happen, for instance. And um, keep the respect levels high, and um, everybody's communicating. <laughs> and everybody's fine about it, really. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. We have a question from Brooke. She's wondering about overnights and about um, uh, past bedtime six. Um, so what age, first of all, do you recommend having overnights? Um, and also, um, if it's not an overnight, if it's past the bedtime, um, how do you handle that? Or do you just make it a rule to not, um, to always have to pick up before the kids go to bed? Um, do you want to go first on something, Julie? So I've only done a couple overnights with my daughter and some other girls. And um, I think the first one was an accidental overnight. <laughs> my husband and I were out late in San Francisco, and my friend and I talked on the phone, and she said, it's 1130. I'm going to bed. And I said, OK, that's fine. Keep her. And I you know, shook in my boots and said, it's her first overnight. <laughs> but it was totally fine. And I picked her up the next morning around 9, and she did not want to leave. She was having so much fun. So I think it really depends on the kid as far as the age of the overnight. Um, I think that it's also totally your decision as their parent to make the choice about that. And um, oh, the other question was about them being asleep, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, yeah, I, I think I pointed out that uh, if there are multiple kids over here and everyone's asleep, I will just reduce my point uh, tally down to the cost for one kid. Um, but you know, again, that's total discretion of the people doing the co-op, of course. And I do keep points because it's your time. You know, you're still um, spending your time to make sure the kids are safe and um, they're over there at your house and you're, you have responsibility for them. So I would definitely keep the point tally going. And um, again, totally your call. You could make sure everyone's picked up by bedtime or you could make it later, whatever the needs are for your group. Renee? Um, we've done both. Not a lot of overnights, although that's starting at around, um, now my son is seven, he's starting to spend the night, so we're starting to have kids overnight. Um, we've done a few over the last year, but I'd say around six or seven is when that starts for us. Um, I will, if somebody brings their child over and they want to come after that child's bedtime, I will put that child in my bed and then uh, they can go to sleep there and then the parents can come scoop them up <clears throat> asleep or I might put them a couple times I think I've had a child fall asleep in my son's bed. He has a queen size bed. So um, two kids will be in there and if they don't sleep then uh, you know we'll try some alternate arrangement but for the most part it's not an issue. Just whatever works. You could have them on the couch, you know. OK. <laughs> sure. Great. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I want to squeeze in one more question from Isa or Issa. Um, she, she's wondering, uh, she heard that there was a, a mom in Chicago that was um, sitting kids at home before the school bus every morning, and that a neighbor called the police and said that she didn't have a daycare license to do this at home. Um, I'm wondering if either of you know of any uh, law concerns for like um, this kind of security clearance and whether it's been an issue for you at all in your years of doing the co-op. Uh, Renee? Um, I've never heard. That's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I haven't heard anything. A couple people have said to me, you know, uh, are you reporting this for tax purposes? And, you know, so that could come up, I suppose. But there's so little, I'm not really sure exactly. Maybe there's an accountant in the group that could tell us. But I, I don't really see that as an issue either. I mean, there's 
uh, you could attach a monetary value to an hour of babysitting, and then you could say that you need to report that or something like that. But I haven't heard anything about laws around having multiple children at your house without um, a child care license. But then our co-op, usually it's not multiple children. Usually it's a family's children, which is all very appropriate in terms of numbers of kids and noise levels and stuff like that. So I don't really see that as an issue. Great, thanks. Uh, can I say real quick, somebody um, sent me a message about getting a list of sample interview questions for families. There is, I think, on the last page of the bylaws that you'll be able to access, there's a list of um, questions. Excellent. That's great to know. Thanks, Renee. Julie, any uh, uh, comments on the legal issue? No, I mean, it sounds like uh, like somebody needs to quit paying that much attention to their neighbors. <laughs> yeah, that sounds rude, but um, anyway, um, no, I mean, you know, it, it's your friend's kids. They're at your house hanging out. It's just like you going over to somebody's house and having coffee. I mean, I don't really see a problem with it. I mean, I, I don't want to at the same time say that I'm this, you know, voice of authority here. I want to put a disclaimer on that. That's my personal opinion. Um, if somebody knows something that I'm doing wrong legally, please tell me. <laughs> but I don't think we are. I mean, um, as far as I know, people have been doing favors for their friends for since the dawn of time, and this is one of those times, as far as I can tell. Excellent. Uh, great way to, to end uh, on that note. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying thank you to everyone for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this webinar. Um, as for next steps, um, we will be sending out a webinar survey um, to ask how you felt about today's webinar. So uh, we would appreciate it if you gave us your feedback. Thank you so much. Um, we will be posting the recording of this webinar, the resources we mentioned, and the slides up on our website and you will receive an email letting you know when they are up and how to access it. So all of that will be available to you um, at the very latest by Monday, but hopefully before then. Um, and I hope that um, you all um, participate in future webinars and other New Dream um, projects and events. We will add you to our mailing list so you'll know about future events. And um, also, as your next step, please go forth and start your babysitting co-op. Start talking to your friends. Start planning um, and figuring out whether this is something that will work for your community. If you have any questions whatsoever about this webinar or New Dream, please feel free to contact me, Wenli, at wen at newdream.org. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending the webinar. Um, thanks for hanging on another extra five minutes. Uh, we hope that this webinar was helpful and that we uh, helped you to think about uh, web, uh, babysitting co-op and how you might be able to start one for yourself. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Wen. Thank you. All right. Take care.